So let me uh, begin with the next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Sambit Datta, uh, who is a professor at Cardin University. Uh, his uh, research focus in on computational design and urban science study. Uh, he's developing new computational knowledge, processes, and tools for understanding architecture and the built environment. Uh, Professor Datta is a well-known academician, have published papers, and uh, very widely known in his field. Uh, I would like to request him to uh, start his presentation and he'll be speaking on digital reconstruction of the architectural evolution of Indic temples across oh, Southeast Asia. Okay. So, over to Professor Sambit Patra to know from him. Thank you, Professor Sambit. Thank you, Professor Gaur. Good morning, everyone, and after that fantastic presentation by Professor Kenderdine, um, I guess you are ready for uh, my presentation, which is going to be on the temples, Indian temples that have been built over the last 1,500 years across South and Southeast Asia. So I'm going to start with uh, basically looking at some simple examples and going on to more complicated ones. And I'll focus on the period 400 to 900 AD. So as you probably know, most of you would be aware, Indian temples or Hindu Brahminic temples were built starting in the Gupta period or slightly earlier. Uh, and they started as small uh, shrines. And over a period of 500 years, they didn't really change much. And my work really focuses on those first 500 years where pretty much they went from being a square cube, simple room, to a slightly bigger, still the same square room with minor modifications. But around the 10th century, they exploded. And this explosion led, you know, conceptually, there was a change, and they became very, very large. They became city scale. And nowhere is this more well uh, observed than in Southeast Asia. The slide below is Bagan, which has 8,000 temples, one of the largest cities of its time. And the entire city structure is built on the basis of replicating the temple architecture. So I don't deal with that yet, but I'll today focus on the smaller shrines in the first 500 years. So why do we want to really look at this corpus of buildings? Basically, we want to understand how a corpus develops as an architect and a researcher. I'm very interested in variations on a theme, whether it's in music, whether it's in architecture or in literature. You know, there is a typology and there is a morphology associated with a particular tradition. So we want to understand that computationally. We also want to use digital tools. You know, over the last 20, 30 years, we have better tools at our disposal to be able to fill in missing information to be able to look underneath the, the, the architecture into the geometry of how they build things, to look at part-hole relationships, to investigate fragments. And also there is a socioeconomic motivation. Most of this work or heritage is a form of capital, you know, which is known in theory as cultural capital. And a lot of these countries are, have living communities uh, you know, with living knowledge of land, water and place, and in today's world, I think it becomes very important to be able to understand the socioeconomic role of these cultures. So looking at the map, uh, you know, I will focus today on stone and brick temples, and that's where the spread is. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of temples in this period, and we've only focused on a few well-known sites. Most of these temples are in ruin. Uh, many of them are not documented. Uh, and uh, most of them, uh, you know, uh, appear in this belt from Kafir Kot in the northwest ranges of Pakistan, is the westernmost temple that we know, uh, and to the uh, Vietnam is the easternmost in Champa. And it spreads right across through India, uh, down to Indonesia in the south, and, uh, you know, is largely concentrated in this belt of South and Southeast Asia. Now, the interesting thing is, of course, you know, we in India are familiar with the origins of the temples in, uh, in the Gupta period, 
but we're not so familiar with the fast spread of these temples into Southeast Asia, and my research really focuses on that. So today I'll cover um, three areas. I'll talk about digital reconstructions. How do we actually take uh, the technologies and create digital replicas or models of these temples? And I will focus on stereoscopic environments, which Sarah has already shown uh, a number of those examples. And finally, I'll end up with physical prototyping, and I'm sure Professor, uh, uh, speaking after me, will be talking a lot more about that as well. So starting with digital reconstructions, um, the techniques that we follow basically are, uh, are covered here. Um, we use photogrammetry, of course, field archives, you know, CAD tools, um, a lot of measurements of various kinds, laser scanning. But that only gives us the object at a particular point in time, its current state. We can only observe the monument or the artifact at the state in which it is today. So that's not enough for us as scholars. We need to be able to go back in time and perhaps look beneath the surface of what we gather in terms of data acquisition. And for that, we use a number of tools from architecture, parametric modeling, so we are able to create geometric reconstructions which have constraints on them, and we use dissections. So we can cut the acquired data in the horizontal uh, plane as well as in the vertical plane. Once we have these tools uh, of in interrogating the data with geometry, we can then build reconstructions. And they start as wireframe models, so we build wireframes, and then gradually we layer these wireframes with different levels of uh, detail, and then we get the final artifact, which is what you see at the bottom. We try to stay away from textures, colors. Uh, we are getting into that. We keep it black and white because we are more interested in the geometric uh, knowledge that is embedded so that we can actually extract uh, more information from that. So basically, this method has been applied to about 35 sites around South and Southeast Asia. In India, we have worked in Ahmedabad, Roda group of temples from the 10th century. Central India, we have done a number, uh, including the Vishnu temple in Deogar in Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the oldest and most classical temples. Uh, we've worked in Eastern India, uh, in Shikhetra, which Sarah showed, uh, in Myanmar, we've worked in Cambodia, along the Mekong River, in Siem Reap, we've worked in Java, and now we are starting work in Trovulan, also in East Java. So when we do these reconstructions, um, essentially, uh, this is probably an example of what happens. You know, we just saw, uh, this is in Myanmar. You have a number of monuments. Uh, usually we select them based on their age and access and permissions. And then finally, it goes through a process of photo modeling. Uh, you know, we use a number of techniques, photogrammetry, uh, taking pictures of the monument, uh, having a, a scanning of them, and we get a point cloud. And most of the point clouds that we get are of this type. Some of them, this is Payathuang in Sri Khetra. It's a very, very interesting temple, which is a solid temple. It doesn't have any internal shrine, but it has four niches, and it has a stupa-like structure at the ends. So once you get this, this is a point cloud, and most of you are familiar with what a point cloud does. Now what we do to this is, is the interesting part of the exercise that we go through. We then take this point cloud and then we dissect it. As I mentioned to you, the dissections, we take a number of profiles, we cut it. And we have some visual uh, tools, visual programming tools, by which we can interrogate every single layer, every single pixel in the horizontal and vertical plane. And from this, we get diagrams which you see there, which are basically single two-dimensional profiles, which we can then investigate to see what the building which looks like uh, today and what the building might have looked like in the past or in its ideal form. We do that for the outside and we also do that for the inside. So this is the, a different temple uh, which has a similar kind of, uh, you know, we take the internal point cloud, that's a point cloud, 
and then we dissect it. And once we begin the dissections, we use classical uh, techniques known in architecture for 3D construction to, uh, you know, smooth out the variations to get some ideal models. So eventually we end up with something like this. We have the interior, we have the exterior, we have some, some amount of thickness, and then we uh, make it like a CAD model. So it's no longer the point cloud, it's purely surfaces, and it has some basis on the dissections that we showed you. Now the interesting thing about this technique is that, as you see below, um, if the dissections are wrong, or if we have made some unclear assumptions about the reconstruction, we can go back and revise it. And so these models are not one-off replicas of the final construct. They are basically parametric variations on a theme of what is possible, sorry, within that frame that we have set up. So just to give you an example, because a lot of scholars are treat digital tools with a great deal of skepticism. When you show them a fine model, they say, yes, but that's, you've invented it. You know, that's not the real thing. So essentially what we have to do is we have to look at the scanned copies you know, of the stupas and monasteries, this is in Myanmar, and then we have to show them the models that we have proposed based on our techniques of dissections and assembly, and then we have to show them how much there is correspondence and how much is variant. So if you look at the last slide, that's basically looking at our model and the final scan and showing you the green is where there's 100% correspondence, the red is where we are in and out. And so there's a certain degree of believability, you know, the, the scholars will say, okay, that's not too bad, but it's still, you know, there's a lot of skepticism. So this is one area of work, you know, techniques for reconstruction. And you can apply it at multiple scales, you know, we've built a large number of tools uh, which help, help us to do that. The second part is really what was intended how did these temples get built? And here we call it canon and temple. As you know, for example, temples are objects that are not creative objects at all. They are almost scientific objects built on the basis of descriptions in text. So, you know, the, the temple architects were not being creative. They were experimenting at a certain level, but they were following very strict instructions, which you might call algorithms, or you might call rules, or you might call grammars which basically have a basis in text. So one of the things that we're trying to do is, for example, here is the Vastupurusha Mandala described in the sixth century, which says, you know, where should the grid lie on the body of the temple? And so by looking at that, we then create not only uh, 2D diagrams of the temple, but 2D diagrams of the text. So we visualize the text and then we compare it with models that have been built. In this case, a 10th century temple which follows the rules described in the Brihat Samhita. So this is a very interesting piece of work because now we are trying to take text, usually in the form of sutras, and converting it into diagrams which can then be used to see whether there is a correspondence or not. So this is Text, the text becomes even more important than the monument. Because here, for example, uh, two examples of monuments. This one is in Myanmar, uh, excavated. Uh, you know, it's an old image. But this is the form of temples that we usually work with. They are in ruin, they have been eroded, they have been de uh, deformed, like in this case. So it's very difficult to take a acqu acquired image and be very confident that you're actually getting the right thing. So the text becomes very, very, very important, and I'll show you in a minute. So what we do then is that we take the acquired information, which have, has deformations, and then we compare it with possible textual references. In this case, of course, with the help of scholars, and then we create ideal models. And then you can see that, you know, we can, I'm sorry that the slide is not very clear, but what is measured is in the middle. You know, what we imagine is an ideal form, and then we can take the deformed object and turn it into an ideal object within some bounds of statistical probability. So this is a very useful tool uh, to, to make a, a temple which is deformed or has missing parts uh, into some form of a hypothesis 
that has a basis in some decisions that we've taken about the dissections. So I wanted to show you that. And then this is an example from Cambodia of a brick temple, 7th, 8th century temple. And we are trying to compare the Vastapurusha Mandala embedding of the grid, which governs all the relationships in a temple, with seven examples in India. And of course, what we find is that the brick temple has moved. You know, it's not a perfect square. And by the way, can I just say that when we measure these temples, some of the temples are millimeter accurate. The level of accuracy is astonishing. You know, so this is something that we have observed in large number of temples that we have measured in, in India and elsewhere. So when it moves like that, you know, over time, four, five hundred years, you know, uh, we have to start to find ways to establish what the grid was. And computers help us do that. And they're fantastic tools uh, to do that. So this is an example of how we create a scaffold. And then we compare the different parts because there's symmetries, inherent symmetries. And then we can make informed assumptions about what it might have been. And the interesting thing is that in Cambodia, this is in Nom Kulen, uh, we find the same grids. At, you know, so that, that means that there is a correspondence between these temples in Cambodia and ancient texts, though we don't have a direct link. So this is, again, just to give you some detail about the dissections. Most of our work is based on these dissections and how we program them. Uh, the text will tell us in detail how the offsets work, you know, what the proportions are, you know, how they should relate to each other, and there are uh, lots and lots of variations of this. But there are largely variations on a theme. So we can then program the horizontal and vertical di dissections. For example, in this temple in Gujarat, uh, 11th, uh, 10th century temple, 9th century temple, uh, it has a very beautiful uh, curved superstructure, and we were very interested in how did they design the curvature and what kind of mathematics were they using. So again, we are able to use these dissections to track the changes and you know, come up with a hypothesis about how the superstructure is designed mathematically and is constructed structurally and then is sculpted you know, in, you know, uh, in a, in a, as a visual form. So if I go back, maybe I should just explain this one. So here is the, the mandala diagram. And then as you move, you find that these rules are described in the text. So what I have done is I've taken the description of the Rekha Sutra, is a geometric text, and it tells you how to take the plan and turn it into a curve on the vertical direction. So we model that and we build this skeleton, and then we fill it in with the information that we have measured, which is on the right-hand side. So here is the structural piece. And each of these uh, facets, you can see that they have a different number of elements in them. For example, the corners, which is known as the Venu Kosha, has nine. You know, it has some relationship with numerology. The, the central, you know, the Bhadra, which is the central wall, has 27, and so on. And they're all related by geometric progression. So we can see that they're not only using, you know, building uh, uh, models of you know, from the, from, the, from, the, from the text, but they're also experimenting with geometry. And here, in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, you find very, very sophisticated geometry, uh, uh, you know, being used, geometric progressions being used, infinite series being used. And so this has been a real bonus for us in our work to use computers, because you can track these things very easily. And uh, because of, you know, the way in which it works. The next piece of work that we're doing is to look at the structural piece, so there is the geometry, there is the structure, and then there's the carvings. You know, and the carvings have their own rhythm. So it's a very, very sophisticated set of uh, technologies that are being used to build a temple. And the recovery of that information, you know, is, is, is very interesting. So here is an example of the motifs. So you've got your dissections from the grid, then you've got your curvature, and then that curvature is then discretized if I may use a computational word, you know, the continuous curve is discretized into a number of blocks, and these are then cut by the, the you know, the, the shilpin of, of that particular tradition, and then assembled on site. So the middle bit that you see is secret knowledge. You know, this is not knowledge that was shared with everyone, where you go from the canonical description of a temple to the, you know, sculpture. But of course, with computers now, we can see, we can show you how 
they, they, they built these things, um, the, these temples with discrete objects following continuous rules. So the moldings are the same. Uh, these are two examples of moldings, one from India, which is on the top, which is that temple that I showed you, and one from uh, Cambodia. And, uh, sorry, this is from East Java. And you can start to see that they're different in terms of the way in which they look, visually different, but in terms of the layering and the way in which the embedding of the plan occurs, they're quite similar. So these are sorts of things that we are, we are working on. Um, coming to the fragments, this is the third piece. I mentioned the geometry, I mentioned the structure, and these are the fragments of temples. So here what happens is that each fragment or each discrete object is based on a understanding of the, the geometry and then is carved by the sculpture, uh, you know, the sculptor who actually carves it. And you will see that there is a grid behind it. You know, so when you see the carving, it's on the surface, but beneath that is a series of grids. And these grids, we, have, we are studying them now. You know, they can be as small as you know, 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, 20 millimeters, I'm just saying in millimeters, very, very small, which govern and control the size of these uh, carvings on the surface and connect back to the original uh, scale of the temples. So we decided to experiment with this and see what happens if we use the computer rather than the sculptor to develop these you know, rules. So here is an algorithm that actually builds uh, different types of curvatures with different rule sets in terms of the number of units and we find that uh, you know, uh, we can pretty much replicate the kind of scaling that happens. Of course, this is now, this is not how they did it. You know, this was done in a, in a different way, but it gives you an idea of the kind of research that we are doing with temple motifs. So that is the first part of my work, and this is a vast and inexhaustible part of work. You know, there's just so much to learn and do. Every single temple uh, tells you new things about the geometry, the mathematics, the material use, uh, the guild system, uh, the way in which they built these is quite incredible, even from a contemporary perspective. The second part of the work really is to do with uh, visualization and uh, stereoscopic environments. How do we actually then see these objects and have a better understanding? So what I'll do is maybe just very quickly mention to you, you've seen a lot of that uh, in Sarah's work already, so I'll skip over some of that. But what we're trying to do is essentially use similar tools to look at the 3D reconstructed models. So for example, here is the Mukunda Nayanar temple in South India, which we have modeled, but we have sliced it into half. And we are able to then uh, look, you know, use our models in, in 3D uh, uh, immersive environments. So what I'll do is I'll just give you a very quick feel for this. You know, so this is a, ability to look at our temples. They're very abstract, and of course this is an immersive visualization, so you can't actually, you can see the left and right eye on the screen, but very early experiments on saying, how can we actually look at these objects, rather than simply walking through them, rather than simply experiencing them as replicas, how do we see them as objects for scholarly work? And you can see that we've kept the textures and the colors, uh, you know, very simple. Um, this is another example uh, of, maybe I can play this, yeah. So simply by using uh, sliders and tools to be able to cut through our dissections. So we've got point clouds, we've got uh, dissections, we've got uh, 3D models. And then we can simply layer them and be able, this is a temple in, in, in Cambodia, it's an octagonal temple which is quite rare, there are very few examples. And so how is it that we can allow people, scholars in the field to use these tools and see what we have done and interrogate it, question it, uh, work on it and give us advice. So we built some interfaces in Unity that allow us to do simple things like, you know, putting the point clouds and the uh, clouds, uh, the, the, our dissections together, including our our, our sections. 
So we've built up a large database of temples. We have about 60 odd temples and it's getting faster now. In the old days, we used to do one or two in a year. And of course, a large part of that one year used to be spent in gathering data. And there's been an acceleration. So um, it's getting more exciting. Uh, we hope to get faster in, in our work. But many of the examples have, there's no temples left. There are only bases, there are, they are eroded. So it takes a lot more time. So I just thought I'd share that with you in terms of the um, immersive visualization work that we are doing with our uh, reconstructions. The third aspect, you know, which is uh, very interesting as well, is the physical models. How do you go from the digital to the physical? And this is something that we've been working on uh, for two reasons. One is that there is nothing like a physical object. You know, in whatever, you know, however immersive a digital experience can be, you know, to be able to take a temple and make a scaled model for various reasons. You can cut it, you can open it, you can keep it on your desk, and this is very, very important part of the work. And secondly, for conservation and reconstruction, we see a lot of bad reconstructions because people try to repair these temples. And we believe that if we can use our tools and techniques and make uh, you know, the, the carvings and the parts highly accurate and scientifically based, we can then generate molds for them to use in the repair and reconstruction of existing temples. So one example is this one here is again the same temple that I showed you earlier. This is the central motif which is up on the, the first tier of the superstructure. And uh, what we did was we modeled it non-invasively and then we created a full-scale replica of half of that part just to demonstrate uh, that, you know, we had the ability to, uh, you know, create high-quality um, um, replicas at scale of very complicated objects. And we understood the geometry and, of course, there was some criticism about this work. This was done maybe 10 years ago. Uh, but the criticism of this work was not whether it was accurate. Nobody argued with that. Uh, most of the people felt that it was very uh, cold. It didn't look like a human had made it. It didn't have the, the art, you know, the craft of making. So I think that, you know, this could be used as, as examples for reconstruction of temples as we move to the next phase. And finally, we can use these uh, uh, reconstructions for uh, learning. I think this is a great object to teach mathematics because it has not only proportion and, you know, relationships of numbers, but it has geometric progressions. And if you have a model, which is a temple, uh, instead of uh, using it only as a religious object, it can also be seen as a scientific object where one can learn about, you know, mathematics that was used 1500 years ago. And the level of accuracy is quite phenomenal. And it has kept me occupied for a long period of time, and I'm sure that it would engage students, high school students, to understand tradition uh, in a different way, not merely as symbolism, but also as living traditions. So in a nutshell now, what we are doing is expanding uh, this work. Uh, we have been uh, looking only at very small temples, and these are the ones that we have done. Um, we are looking at slightly larger and more complicated temples. The uh, temple Telika Mandir in Gwalior is uh, one example that we have completed. Uh, this is an example in Vishnu temple in Diogar, which I mentioned to you earlier. This is a replica of the Vishnu Dharmattar Purana, which was written in the 6th century. It's an exact replica, and a lot of scholars have correlated the text to the temple. But it's actually in ruin now, and it's a very large temple. And you can see that some parts of the temple have been rebuilt based on some of the work that we've done. But uh, one of the dream projects that we have is to recreate the uh, Vishnu temple in the Yogar uh, as, a, as a digital model following the Vishnu Dharmattar Purana. So the temples expand, this is in Java. We have now expanded to the, this is central Java. We have done uh, temples in Dieng and Gedong Songo. We have done about 15. We haven't gone to Borobudur and Kalasan, which are Buddhist sites. But we have shifted across to East Java to a place called Trovulan, which has tremendous uh, 15th century site. It's a city, one of the largest cities of the 15th century. And again, structured by temples. 
And finally, we are also looking at uh, comparing these models from Java. These are temples from Indonesia with temples in India and Cambodia. And in Cambodia, we have done uh, quite a bit of work in uh, near Angkor, not in Angkor, but outside in Nom Kulen, which is the older Angkor, in Sambor Prekuk, which is one of the oldest cities in Asia. And this year, uh, sorry, next year, we'll start work on the south of Phnom Penh in Ashram Maharose. <laughs> Thank you. So, I guess. No? Okay. For your stop. excellent presentation, I was very happy to know about you because my organization is also engaged in some of the little work. We have documented number of temples where they share. We have also signed an agreement with Shamri for this Angkor Wat. Yes. So I'm, I'm personally keenly looking forward to work with you and would be happy to invite you to IGNCA. Thank you. And there are a number of things which you might be interested in IGNCA. You, you might have heard of this Samarangana Sutra yes. of Raja Bhoj. Yes. Uh, we have been translating Adam it Han, yeah. and uh, almost six volumes will be uh, launched soon. We, we are planning to release it. Yeah. I uh, use it very much. Thank you very yeah. much for the good and, work. And we have a number of other manuscripts on architecture, ancient architecture, which yeah. might help in understanding the iconography and Absolutely. other things. So we'll be happy to uh, work and collaborate with you. Thank so you. we give a big round of applause for <laughs> Professor Dutta. It's a unique work and very, very important work he's doing. And we must be proud of him for such an excellent work in preserving our culture and also understanding um, many things. Because I was just I want to share one thing. Uh, like We talk about ancient architecture or uh, earthquake resistance buildings. So, I, during many of the manuscripts which we have housed in one of the talk, one professor, even he talked about that this earthquake resistance model was there in, in the Indian uh, ancient architecture system, which we need to decipher and need to, that it is not the new concept, it was very old concept according to Indian arch ancient architecture system. Thank yeah. you very much. We'll take up question in that and I thank you very much for… Thank you.